The Tom Woods Show, episode 730. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here spending my Labor Day making a Labor Day episode. Yeah, I should have done this a little sooner, but, well, I'm still busy. Still lots of errands to run and lots of craziness around here, but getting back to normal little by little. So I thought, ah, eh, what the heck? Let's Why not talk about labor unions? We're getting a lot of labor union propaganda over the weekend, so let's try and set some of this straight. My own father was a teamster for many years, so I have plenty of first-hand or almost first-hand experience with labor unions. I incidentally, it so happens, let's see, I'm recording this on, what? what is today's date? Let's check here. I'm recording this, I guess, so, okay, Labor Day is September 5th, 2016. That's when I'm recording this. Two days ago was the 20th anniversary of my father's death, actually. He died very young, very suddenly. It was a fluke kind of thing. Uh, very, very unexpected. And he was a great guy, and I, um, you know, I was, I've been thinking about him quite a bit this weekend. Very, very sad to lose him so soon, and he didn't get to meet the children, you know, meet his grandkids, and he would have just been crazy about them. So it's a real shame, but anyway, he really is the guy who got me on the right path. I mean, he was not a libertarian, but I think I could have brought him around, actually. I do. He was, um, I wouldn't say he was a Reagan Democrat, because if you called him any kind of Democrat, he would have punched you in the face. But he was, he wasn't full-on laissez-faire, but he generally believed in the free market and low taxes and entrepreneurship and stuff like that. And he was anti-communist, and he taught me a lot of this stuff. He did not go to college. He did not finish high school. He, he, he got his GED when he was in his 40s. But all the same, he was very, very knowledgeable, and he was constantly reading and learning more and more. And he at least made sure that I was, I was not a leftist. And I'm telling you, even though as time went on, I moved beyond some of Dad's ideas and I became more consistently free market and stuff, I still look back and, and wonder if without his guidance, if I would have just been a leftist. That's a very, very easy position to fall into it you just you just accept conventional wisdom on everything and you accept the surface explanation for everything and it's very easy to become a leftist you don't have to dig very deep to do that and I'm afraid I would have gone down that path if it hadn't been for him so I'm very grateful for that so in terms of labor unions let's talk a little bit about this how they work and the the current state of, of US labor law is something that I talk about a bit in, let's see, where do I talk about that? I talk about that in my book, 33 Questions. 33 Questions about American History You're Not Supposed to Ask. Possibly my favorite, that and Real Descent, I think, are my two favorites among the books I've written. So there's a treatment of that. There's some stuff in the church and the market on labor unions that I'm pretty happy with. Over at libertyclassroom.com in our course, U.S. History Since 1877, I have a lecture called Episodes in Labor History, 1886 to 1894, that goes into some of the most common labor episodes that you will read about in any American history textbook and gives, I guess, a revisionist account of those. So you can check that out at libertyclassroom.com. So I've got some stuff on labor unions scattered around here and there. So what I want to do is just talk a little bit about what the deal is with them, and is it really true that labor unions gave us the weekend? Because you get that all the time. And on my email list this weekend, it's my intention to send out a note. Well, in fact, no, I did. I already sent out an email saying, bearing in mind that labor unions did not, in fact, bring you this or any other weekend, I hope you're enjoying your Labor Day weekend. All right, the idea behind labor unions is that a free labor market where people simply enter into labor contracts of you know they can accept or reject any labor any offer that's made to them so that is to say a worker can accept or reject compensation and a a, uh, a company can accept or reject any type of counter offer 
that this this leads to exploitation of workers that business firms are in a position to squeeze workers and make their lives very difficult and more or less coerce them into accepting uh, wage rates that are lower than what they ought to be offering basically so if workers can get together in labor unions and organize and agitate together and put pressure on employers they can balance out this um, this situation they're in in which they have a lower bargaining they have less bargaining power than employers so there's some stuff on that in 33 questions that goes into whether the bargaining power argument really holds for now let's go into how do labor unions bring about better wages and working conditions for their members and what they do is insist on a higher wage rate than they would get in the absence of unionism that's basically how they do it now what does that mean if they're now getting a higher wage than they would otherwise get then that means that the employer is going to hire fewer workers than he would have otherwise same of the same effect of the minimum wage uh, in any part of the economy employers will hire fewer of a more expensive factor than they would if the factor had been less expensive so in this indirect way labor unions do exclude people the people who would have been hired if the employer had been in a position to hire more people but now this excess of people are not hired what happens to those people and by the way of course this is enforced sometimes through through picketing and and through you know through the through the picket line and that is a peaceful form of protest on the surface but on the other hand it's obviously intended to intimidate because as Murray Rothbard points out if the entire purpose of the picket was simply to inform people that there was a labor dispute underway you could have one guy holding a sign to tell them that or you could take out ads in the local newspaper or something what possible purpose could be served by a whole bunch of people walking around carrying signs if not to intimidate the public intimidating the public uh, in terms of uh, entering the property and and being a patron of this particular firm or other workers who might say well look you might not want to work for that amount of money but I sure would like to those people are intimidated from uh, they're intimidated into into silence basically and into acquiescence in what the labor union is up to so the principle of the labor union really is I will not work for such and such wage and you will not work for that wage either whereas up till you know up through the 19th century and into the early 20th century the the general principle was you are free to say you won't work for a particular wage but you're not free to speak for other people you can't say well he won't work for that wage either because we're gonna violently prevent his entry and we're gonna prevent you from hiring him we're gonna prevent you from replacing any of us with him and while I'm on this by the way I wanna point out something very very little known that has to do with Pope Leo the thirteenth who is sometimes credited with basically launching Catholic social teaching with his 1891 encyclical rerum Novarum about labor and people just take for granted oh he was a pro-union pope and and uh, because they don't know no one's read rerum Novarum of course which I have some some comments about let's say in my book the church and the market but what's very interesting is when you actually ask Leo the 13th what is it about labor unions that you support or how do you expect them to function he wrote this in 1895 this is the passage nobody ever quotes he said whilst it is proper and desirable to assert and secure the rights of the many yet this is not to be done by a violation of duty and that these are very important duties not to touch what belongs to another to allow everyone to be free in the management of his own affairs not to hinder anyone to dispose of his services when he please and where he please so of course what he's expressing there is the exact opposite of coercive labor unionism so of course these people are going to continue to cite Leo the 13th on behalf of their ideas but now I've just made clear they're either ignorant of his views or just liars at any rate the people who are fortunate enough to be in the union get the benefits they get the working conditions they want they get the wage rates they want 
But as we've seen, this comes at the expense of other people. These, this comes at the expense of people who are not hired in the first place and who now need to go look somewhere else. Now, the fact that they're having to look somewhere else and that they would have preferred to work in the first industry indicates that they're more suited to work in that first industry than they are in the second one. So the second one, almost by definition, is going to earn them a lower wage, not to mention that the dumping of all these extra people into these other industries is going to push wage rates down there. So these people suffer. But these people don't really count for anything because they are scabs. They are, they're described using these dehumanizing words that the progressive left would not allow you to use in any other context. But in this case, you can dehumanize away. And of course, meanwhile, the people who are forced out of the original industry and into something else, are these were people who were skilled in that particular industry they were driven out of. And so all the time they spent acquiring those skills was a waste. And now they're going to go on working somewhere else where all those original skills are wasted and society doesn't enjoy the benefits of them. So there are losses to them, certainly, and to society, and, and to society at large. Um, for one thing, as I say, we don't get the benefits of all the training that they had. But Morgan Reynolds, who was in the Bush Labor Department, actually, don't hold that against him. He was, a, he was actually a good labor economist, says uh, he, he's identified seven distinct ways in which labor unionism imposes substantial costs on the economy. So, uh, number one, the redistribution of income from the general community to union bureaucracies and their members. Two, the unemployment effects of unions. Three, the consequences of union wage inflexibilities over the business cycle. Four, the cost of union work rules, which is, these are rules that are basically meant to, to make work cumbersome and as labor-intensive as possible so as to benefit the members of labor unions, but of course to make the production process relatively inefficient. Five, the dynamic impact of unions in discouraging research and development, investment, and entrepreneurship. Six, the direct costs of strikes, strike threats, negotiating costs, labor consultants, National Labor Relations Board elections, bureaucratic costs, grievance costs, and related expenses. Seven, the political role of unions in increasing inflation, international trade barriers, government spending, and related forms of discoordination sustained by political action. And then Murray Rothbard, in further elaborating on my point about forcing people out of the industry they're most suited for, Rothbard says this, Consequently, at best, a union can achieve a higher restrictionist wage rate for its members only at the expense of lowering the wage rates of all other workers in the economy. Production efforts in the economy are also distorted. But in addition, the wider the scope of union activity and restrictionism in the economy, the more difficult it will be for workers to shift their locations and occupations to find non-unionized havens in which to work. And more and more, the tendency will be for the displaced workers to remain permanently or quasi-permanently unemployed, eager to work but unable to find non-restricted opportunities for employment. The greater the scope of unionism, the more, per the more a permanent mass of un unemployment will tend to develop. Unions try as hard as they can, Rothbard continues, to plug all the loopholes of non-unionism, to close all the escape hatches, where the dispossessed workmen can find jobs. This is termed ending the unfair competition of non-union low-wage labor. A universal union control and restrictionism would mean permanent mass unemployment growing ever greater in proportion to the degree that the union exacted its restrictions. Now incidentally, it may occur to you that the question ought to be addressed, well then what what do you do to make wage rates go up? Well, certainly making some people's wage rates go up and ruining the lives of other people is probably not the best way. I've talked about this in a previous episode, episode 356, which I will link to at tomwoods.com slash 730. Wow, that's more than half the show ago. Good grief, uh, episode 356. How about that? Anyway, that's covered there. To make a long story short, wages rise 
when you have more capital investment, you have investment in machinery to make the productive process more physically productive, more goods are produced, the greater number of goods in the economy, thanks to competitive pressures, puts downward pressure on those prices, which means that any given dollar that you earn will now command more goods. And that makes you wealthier. That makes the whole society wealthier. So that's the basic way that wage rates rise and, and that, that occurs on the free market and of course the the less you tax that process the more it will occur so check out episode 356 which would be tomwoods.com slash 356 if you're interested in more about that on the ins and outs of labor law and how it evolved over the years my chapter in 33 questions will uh, will certainly help you but I do want to at least read you this passage by Edward Chamberlain who tries to describe for you what labor law today is like by giving the example of two people bargaining over the sale of a house. So instead of bargaining over labor, they're bargaining over the sale of a house. And let me read this to you because his point is that you can more clearly see the difficulties with labor unionism by means of this analogy. If A is bargaining with B over the sale of his house, and if A were given the privileges of a modern labor union, he would be able, one, to conspire with all other owners of houses not to make any alternative offer to B, using violence or the threat of violence if necessary to prevent them, two, to deprive B himself of access to any alternative offers, three, to surround the house of B and cut off all deliveries, including food, except by parcel post. 4. To stop all movement from B's house, so that if he were, for instance, a doctor, he could not sell his services and make a living. And 5. To institute a boycott of B's business. All of these privileges, if he were capable of carrying them out, would no doubt strengthen A's position. But they would not be regarded by anyone as part of bargaining, unless A were a labor union. All right, so let's turn now to working conditions. And of course, being able to work fewer hours or enjoy the weekend, which is one of these themes of Labor Day weekend. Hey, we brought you the weekend. That's kind of a subset of the idea of, of working conditions. So let's start with working conditions as typically understood. And then let's apply that to, let's say, reducing work hours, which is also a thing that a lot of people would like to see. And let's see what role labor unions play in any of this, if any. So let's take, for example, I've, I've used this example before. Let's take, for example, the introduction of air conditioning into workplaces. Now, air conditioning has not actually been around very long. You know, geologically speaking, it certainly hasn't been around very long. It's just a flash in the pan. It's like nothing. So what if we had said, as soon as air conditioning was invented, we said, all right, every workplace has to have air conditioning. Well, this would have overwhelmed most firms with expenses and they wouldn't have been able to survive so obviously that would have been too fast so then on what basis can we decide the pace at which air conditioning ought to be introduced into the workplace just saying that there's a desirable amenity isn't sufficient because even even people who would like to see that amenity introduced they don't want to see the firm go out of business then have no job at all so how do we decide? Well, there is no non-arbitrary way to make that determination. And of course, there's no logical stopping point. I mean, everybody would love to have a view of Niagara Falls or you know, five-hour lunch breaks or the services of a masseuse, but it'd be hard to be employed. Most, most people would find it hard to get employment in the first place if they demanded these amenities. So how, in general, does it make sense to introduce amenities in such a way that you're, that the worker is not priced out of the job. That's, that's the key thing. How do you make sure that you're not pricing workers out of a job or impoverishing society out of proportion to the satisfaction derived by workers who now enjoy air conditioning, for example? Well, the answer really comes through compensating differentials, which is a, a feature of market wage determination. So we all know that there are certain lines of work that carry a wage premium to attract people there, you know, like the dirty jobs show, for example. 
you know, because they're unpleasant or they're very difficult or there's something undesirable about them. And to get people to do them, you got to pay them a little extra. I mean, if I can, if I can work at McDonald's uh, for the same wage as ditch digging or something, I would just work at McDonald's. So you're going to have to get me, give me a reason to leave McDonald's. And the answer, the, the way that's done, is by compensating differentials. There'll be a differential in the wage rate to compensate you for the undesirable aspect of the work. Well, as time goes on, air-conditioned workplaces become more and more common. And therefore, a workplace that does not have air conditioning now becomes one of these undesirable, unpleasant places to work that you would now have to... I mean, if, if Wendy's has air conditioning and McDonald's doesn't, I'll just go work at Wendy's. So to compensate me for the lack of air conditioning at McDonald's, you're going to have to pay me more. And eventually, what typically happens is that the wage differential that, let's say, McDonald's, I'm just taking this as, obviously, these are ridiculous examples, but let's imagine McDonald's is non-air conditioned for workers. The wage differential that McDonald's would have to pay in order to attract workers away from Wendy's eventually reaches a level where it's less expensive. Just go ahead and introduce the air conditioning. Then you won't have to pay the differential. The same analysis applies to safety. Employers don't care whether you're getting your compensation in the form of cash or in the form of improved working conditions. It's all the same to them. It makes no difference. All you can do as a policymaker, so-called, is shuffle around the combinations, but you're not increasing the overall compensation package. That's fixed. The employer is going to pay only so much, and if you tell him, well, you have to offer this, you have to offer that, he's just going to take it out of the, the cash compensation, which is why the work of Ben Powell is so interesting. I'm going to link to a presentation Ben gave at the Mises Institute not long ago. Ben's been on the show before, and what I find interesting about uh, about that presentation is that Ben actually went to Guatemala, and he went to a couple of places that have been condemned as sweatshops. And he went and asked the workers themselves different questions about their compensation packages. Would they rather have certain amenities and get slightly lower take-home pay, or would they rather just have the money? And given that they're extremely poor, overwhelmingly the answer was we'd rather have the money. And that's, that's exactly the, the decision that you yourself would make and that I would make if I were extremely poor. I'll deal with, you know, I'll get a pay, I'll, I'll hope for a paid vacation five years down the road. That's the least of my worries now, the absolute least. I just want to put food on the table. How ridiculous would it be to force me to take a paid vacation? I don't even want that. I want the money. And, of course, if my employer is required to give me a paid vacation, well, that means he's going to be lowering my compensation the rest of the year. I want the cash. <laughs> that's what I want. So that's, it turns out, overwhelmingly what these workers said that right now what we want is the cash and then as you get wealthier as the society gets wealthier you can afford that combination of compensation where you take home less cash but enjoy other amenities so ben asked them things like are you are you willing to work for lower pay if your employer reduced the number of hours you have to work uh, made your hours more predictable gave you more bathroom breaks, gave you longer lunch breaks, made your working conditions more pleasant, made your working conditions safer, provided health insurance, and, and on and on and on. Overwhelmingly, the answer was no. It ranged from in the 80s to the upper 90s percent no. So made your working conditions safer? 97 percent no. I would not want that in exchange for giving up some of my take-home pay. I'd rather have the money overwhelmingly when you actually bother to ask people they say I'm capable of negotiating for the combination of compensation that I prefer and this the, the these are their preferences now let's think about how this analysis would apply to w the hours that you work people worked backbreaking hours in the 19th century and into the 20th century there's no question about that but if you ask them would you rather have fewer hours and correspondingly less money? Overwhelmingly, the answer was no. I need the money. Don't, don't try to help me 
by imposing on me a second best alternative. You can be assured that the one I've chosen is the best option I have, as undesirable as it may look to an outsider. So in the same way, as the society becomes wealthier, you can afford to opt for more leisure. And I'm sure everybody listening to this can imagine that or has had that happen. Where as, as you've begun to earn more, you, you can think in terms of not working the two jobs or working fewer hours or taking more vacations or whatever. That begins to seem plausible to you. Even though you could earn more money, you could earn more cash if you kept working 80, 80 hours a week, but you've decided you value the leisure more. And so, again, employers, they don't care. They're going to give you the compensation they're going to give you and whatever you want to do with it. Uh, like if you want, if you're willing to work, let's say you were working 80 hours and now you want to work 60 hours a week. So that's three quarters as many hours. Well, if you're willing to accept a wage rate that's three quarters as large or even slightly below three quarters as large so that the employer would even enjoy a premium from you uh, in granting you the lower hours, what poss- of course the employer will grant that. It's completely in the employer's interest to do that. That's where the lab- that's where the weekend comes from. That capitalism is so productive that we can we we can produce enough stuff without having to work seven days a week. We can actually afford to take two days off. By contrast, if you look at a primitive economy, if you look at a lot of third world countries, what, what are you saying that that the way out of their poverty is just to create more labor unions and have the labor unions force the weekend on them? This would kill them. I mean, they, they need to be working because their production processes are so primitive, they need the sheer brawn of seven days worth of human labor to be able to produce enough stuff for people to survive. You can't just say, well, labor unions are now asking for two days off a week, so let's go celebrate. Because even if they got that, nobody would want it under those conditions. It's only because we're rich enough to be able to afford two days off a week that the weekend even becomes conceivable. So it is capital, not labor, that got us the weekend. And I think to myself, in my own situation, I get a lot of speaking invitations, and I turn most of them down. Even though I could earn a lot of extra money by doing more public speaking. But I really, really value the time with my family. And it's really discombobulating for me to be flying all over the place. That's not to say I, I won't accept your invitation. I may, but I don't accept all of them. And as I say, if, if all that mattered to me was cash, and in the old days it did, I flew around like crazy. But now I've gotten to a point where my own personal economy, let's say, has become better. And so now I can afford to choose. So you're, my, my life is like a microcosm of the whole economy over the course of several generations where you get to a point of physical comfort where you say you know I would I'm willing to trade the extra money I might earn by driving myself crazy for leisure time to recuperate from my work and to enjoy my life so yeah there you a lot of times you just could not pay me to get on a plane and fly somewhere but that is not how it always was it was not always that way for me and it, it's not has not always been that way in history for workers that they would say, "Please, I want um, to work less and earn correspondingly less." That is not what they want. What they want at, at the very beginning is money. And as the society becomes wealthier, they can afford to opt for a different mix of working conditions, working hours, and cash. That's it. There is no other way to do this that doesn't actually hurt the people these do-gooders are supposedly intending to help. All right, so I've got some goodies for you then. I'm going to put that Ben Powell talk up. I'm going to link to my previous episode where I talk about wage rates and what really makes them rise. And in honor of Labor Day, I mean, let's let's talk about somebody, a site, uh, a show listener, who actually who does work so it's labor day and this person works as an editor and i do want to tell you about her brand new site that she created through my link and it's called th- she, and she's got a special deal for you so so listen in you think you don't need editing services you probably haven't read your writing uh, with a critical enough eye i'll put it that way her site is 3tediting.com it's the number 3 the letter t editing.com 
This service describes itself as a simple way for social media entrepreneurs and self-published authors or bloggers to get the editing help they need to increase their readership and keep the focus on their message, not their mistakes. It offers affordable editing packages to authors, and they work on retainer for social media entrepreneurs, online content creators, and students. So to celebrate the launch of the site during this month, September 2016, any social media entrepreneurs, online content creators, or students who mention the Tom Woods Show can get their first three hours of editorial services for just 20 smackers. Now, that is ridiculous. I mean, that, there's a sweatshop wage right there. Three hours of editorial services for just 20 bucks. If you mention the Tom Woods Show, that's ridiculous. So head over, check it out at 3tediting.com, the number three, the letter T, editing.com. And if you are thinking of starting a website, don't even take the first step until you've looked at tomwoods.com slash publicity, because if you start it out with me, you get a lot of great bonuses and freebies and promotion from me. So check out tomwoods.com slash publicity. Tomorrow, I'm not totally sure what we're going to cover, but sometime this week, we are definitely doing the whole private prisons controversy, and I believe this may be the week of the debate I have been promising you about a mysterious subject. All I can tell you is you're going to love it. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.